just so everyone knows, it's perfectly fine with me if you want me to like mute out or clip out your your audio if you decide to speak later. Just want everyone to be fully informed that recording is in progress. Let's see. So this will not stay on my ears. Ah. All right. Hi everybody. Uh, Hello. This is. AI is here, now what? Uh, I'm Matt Arnold. I'm the podcaster of Fluidity Audiobooks. And I narrate audiobooks, and one of them, this summer, is going to be Better Without AI by David Chapman, my friend and collaborator. And I've narrated several of his books. He is a former artificial intelligence researcher who broadly takes credit or blame, depending on how you want to talk about it, for having completely discouraged the entire field of AI in 1990 to 1991. Uh, and then there came, in the intervening decades, what we call error backpropagation, or machine learning, or deep learning. Um, and he's written an entire book about what it is that we are seeing now, and I'm uh, mostly cribbing from conversations that he and I had during the writing of this book. And, and a lot of material that's in this sl uh, slide deck is not in the book because we cut it, but it's actually pretty important in other contexts for a, um, a, 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 like a lay audience. So he was writing that for researchers. Uh, and this is called, this is um, called AI is here, now what? And I'm going to, I hope, give you a unique perspective that you're not necessarily going to get in literally every talk we are about to be destined to hear, which is going to tell you the generics about AI. Uh, this is going to have a perhaps surprising um, contention within it. So, First, let's start with a little bit of terminology about what we are even talking about. There we go. So, one of the problems that a lot of developers have is that they'll name a method in their artificial intelligence something like learning, or they'll name it knowledge, or they'll name a function something like training. They'll name their process or their software. I mean, honestly, what are they going to name it? They're faced with a problem where the closest metaphor they can find is the thing that they are trying to accomplish with software, but the problem is that their colleagues then look at that method later on and say, oh, they wrote something that does learning? Fantastic, this is learning. And even we developers can fool ourselves into believing that we have, in fact, actually done the thing that the English language words naturally refers to when human beings do it, when, in fact, that's not what it does at all. Um, with what we call the so-called learning, neural networks, neural networks borrow from the metaphor of the human brain and don't work like actual human brain or any biological brain neurons. But it was the closest metaphor they can reach for. It's not neural, it's just not. Um, there's nothing learning about deep learning or machine learning. It's not encoding quote unquote knowledge. All of this is deeply confused. Uh, there's no understanding or things like that. Uh, millions of dollars will be spent training a model in statistical prediction of text, all incredibly fancy autocomplete, or in, let's say, prediction of an image, or how a prediction of how an image will be classified or what have you. Now, I want to also draw a vocabulary distinction between the actual inference, which is runtime, and this training. So the training is, they spend millions of dollars training the model on a massive training set, and again, Calling it training could mislead us if we're not careful. Um, and it trains itself through an almost like an evolutionary process. Again, it's impossible to talk about this without bringing in metaphors that don't quite apply. Is it really evolution? It tries to predict things, and when it fails, that's down, sort of it like down focus itself, to put it in layman's terms. And when it succeeds, it up focus that. And pretty soon, it has something that's pretty good at predicting correctly and succeeding at predicting things. That's what they call training. Now, the inference that I mentioned before, the runtime, is when I actually go to an AI that is a finished model, they finish spending millions of dollars doing that. And now I say, here is my prompt, and it responds. Here is my prompt to mid-journey or some other um, uh, image synthesis software, and it gives me an image. That's called inference, so let's keep that in mind. These are two different things. Uh, currently, these are wildly massively wasteful. A lot of money, even though uh, ChatGPT is currently the single most successful, or how do you put it, like fastest and most successful growing consumer product in the world's history, 
it's still not making money. It's that inefficient. Uh, and that may change in the future, but that's, that's the state of the situation as it, as it currently occurs. So let's just be aware that some of, the, some of the words that we're talking about are misleading if we just take it at face value. So, superintelligence is one of them. Uh, there's a lot. There's there's two different camps of people worried about quite, you know, like uh, I I think it's great. They're both worried about types of problems. One problem is the type of problem in which uh, which we see in the world, in which what you thought you were training for was this, but what you actually trained for was somebody's skin color. What you thought you were training for, well, like, oh, you've got to train a model to not tell us how to make bombs or what have you. But though that is separate from the idea of a super intelligence that invents nanotechnology by sitting and thinking in its head and turns everybody into great goop. These are two classes of problems that people address. Um, and they both bring an interesting perspective and probably could benefit from talking to each other more than they currently do. But what on earth even is superintelligence? It's a deeply confused concept, and it's not at all clear that any increase in intelligence past a certain threshold that we've seen in humans is even a coherent concept. Uh, we could perhaps be more worried about just massive clones of unbelievably dumb AI that do massive amounts of work and outcompete you because a crowd of AIs can do it faster even though they're each individually dumb. That might be a better, a better framing. Well, what even is superintelligence? Actually, step back and ask yourself that. Can you think in your head, you know what, I'm going to set up a computer simulation of physics, and that physics simulation is going to teach me how to make nanotech in 10 seconds, or like less than a second, because I'm such a fast supercomputer. Well, how did, you, how did you know your simulation was correct? Unless you did science to find out the simulation was correct. But the problem is, the fact that your simulation is still incorrect because you don't have perfect science means your simulation is always imperfect, which is exactly what supercomputer simulations consistently run into, which means an AI would have to run an, uh, run an experiment on reality and wait for reality to do something and find out what reality does, which takes real-world clock time. So that's what we need to think about when it comes to superintelligence. When we think about, well, what, what, it might just mean superhuman performance. We've had superhuman performance since the 50s. We've always had superhuman performance in computers. Well, what superhuman performance are we talking about? Try to be less confused about this. Um, <coughs> superintelligence is something that you don't know what it means, and it's so much smarter than you that you can't imagine what it will mean. Well, we've always had that. There's always been this risk that something is going to come along and be like, well, Throw everything into a top hat. We always have that. We always will. Unknown unknowns. That's what that is. Uh, and so we always already have things we don't know what they mean or how possible they are and are therefore impossible to reason about. And most of those we already don't even know about. And this is not different. That is not a thing that's now different. There are real risks. And this is not one of them yet. Maybe it will be. But we have real risks that this talk is going to be about that are already occurring. And uh, so suspiciously, um, if you tell me that, my, that the future AI you are afraid of is similar to God, in that it is so far above you that your argument is irrelevant, well, that argument is irrelevant too. And that argument is irrelevant, too. No matter how good my arguments are, they're always irrelevant because God's smarter than you and the supercomputer is smarter than you. You might be right in both cases. I'm being agnostic about whether God exists and about whether the future superintelligence exists, but I want to point out a social move you just made by making that argument. That you have, in both cases, cartoonishly high stakes, heaven and hell, uh, cartoonishly high stakes, such as the infinite dystopian future of I have no mouth and I must scream, versus the, the infinite utopian future of AI brings about uh, uh, gay space communism. Right? Infinitely wonderful or infinitely horrible in our lifetimes is about to occur. It's like if you don't go out and door to door soul win, 
you are destining people to have their skin peel off in the flames of hell while they regenerate so they can be tortured for eternity. These cartoonishly high stakes in Silicon Valley, in the San Francisco Bay Area, especially Berkeley, have, I am not making this up, created what I like to call high control groups because the word cult gets thrown around too sloppily. Um, they literally have existed. People are getting stabbed with samurai swords. Uh, it's in the news. Like all my friends who are in Silicon Valley are talking about, like people are going there just like in the days of the gold rush to California. I am gonna change the world. This sort of moral anxiety Everything is at stake on whether I personally write AI or make AI safe. Everything is at stake. And they kind of go off the rails, but I want to be clear here. It doesn't mean you're wrong. I'm pointing out the conversational move you make that creates a social dynamic in which you've got to do the things the group tells you to do or we all die. So those are just prerequisites I'm laying out, laying that out at the beginning. Um, it is a universal counter-argument to say there is something so smart that no matter what argument you make, it doesn't matter. Uh, hypothetical infinities, cartoonishly high stakes, super intelligent beings that are so far above you. These are the, these are the parallels on 20. The arsenals. So, um, so calling something AI. There is a rice cooker that has AI in it, and all this meant that they took out the perfectly functional control systems that we've had in cybernetics for almost a century, and they put in something they don't understand. <laughs> it is a statistical model that sort of predicts loosely whether or not the rice is done, or how much rice you put in, how much water you put in, and actually deeply and intensely underperforms the previous model of rice cooker. Why did they do that? Because it is a glitzy PR stunt to say, it's AI. Anybody here ever watch Invader Zim? Remember, Gur? <laughs> I'm advanced! <laughs> That's exactly what it is. But here's the, here's the move that Google, Facebook, and Microsoft are now doing. Two things. There is a employee who is an artificial employee, and who knows why people do what they do. It's an artificial person. We built it. Now that it's a person, oh, who knows why they do it? We're blaming it, as opposed to a machine that is literally your whole job to debug. It was literally your whole job to make machines that do the thing that you wanted them to do and don't do the things that you didn't want them to do. And now notice that you don't have to do that anymore on this side, right? You don't have to do that anymore. Now, simultaneously, it is an oracle that does things for this God works in mysterious ways. And man, this oracle is just, I don't know why it thinks that you should lose your, your um, unemployment insurance. I don't know why it thinks that you shouldn't be diagnosed with the thing that you have or whatever. Man, what? It's just an oracle. And it's just so amazingly mysterious how it works. Like, it just must know something you don't. But they get to pull this in two separate directions at the same time. That's the glitzy PR sense, which is almost the entire thing that happens when you take out a system you do understand, like control theory or cybernetics, that you can step by step go through the whole, what I call, uh, inference at runtime and see what it's doing and why it didn't do the thing that you wanted it to do, and you replace it with something that is an inscrutable black box. It's for PR reasons, and almost every time somebody puts AI into something, it's, an a, it's a PR stunt. I mean, notice how much attention it gets and how sexy it looks. You can make a lot, you can advance your career and make a lot more money doing that, unfortunately, because it just makes you look so amazing. And AI can be better. That's my contention. I'm not against AI. And these statistical systems that I want to call error backpropagation can be good. But not if you decide that the reason you want them is so that you don't have to do that. I didn't think I covered that either on the, uh, the scare quotes slide. Here's all these words we shouldn't use. It's error back propagation. That's what it is. That is the term for what it actually does. It's not learning. It's a different thing. It's not a worse thing. It's not learning. It's not understanding. It is a statistical model that is trained by back propagating all the errors it makes in the way that I described as an almost quasi evolutionary process to model itself. Error back propagation, so keep that term in mind. So, on the line, um, 
Water language models, all they do is autocomplete text. And there was a, there used to be a, a game in which you could input a number that you would pay for a Persian rug. And the rug salesman would then compete by offering you a different number. And the object of that game, it was on a website, the game was to actually negotiate them to a, as good a price as you could. They replaced this with an AI, large language model, to see what that would do as a negotiating partner. The problem is that you could simply tell it, you could change the frame in a way that you couldn't before. I'm a very rich and important man. I'm very influential. I could take your rugs and I could hang them on my, my balls and you'd make so much money because people would be influenced and the AI would believe this. You can get that AI consistently to pay you to take its entire rug inventory. <laughs> Gratis. But why? Have you ever heard the phrase, the map is not the territory from Korbinski? The map is the territory. Arabic propagation's map is only, the territory is only a map. It doesn't have any rugs. It knows it doesn't have any rugs. There are two little children playing make-believe, and if you tell it, I am make-believing that I'm a big important man, it's like, okay, I'm make-believing that you are a big important man, or whatever you say, it then role-plays whatever you tell it. As if that's just further prompting to say, hey, what I'm asking you to do is please give me all your rugs for free because they don't even exist. And it's like, yeah, they don't even exist. Here's all my rugs for free. You win non-existent rugs, I lose non-existent rugs. The rugs don't exist. But one of the problems with actually putting this into any system that matters is that it doesn't know that your cancer is real. For you, it's not real for it. It's measuring some other thing, and all it's trying to do is auto-complete whatever you gave it. It's not reliable. Never hook up. Never hook it up to a real-world system with any stakes at all. If you do, you have to do much better than we are currently doing now. You can't just do this PR stunt for any system that actually exists. It's pure power, not intelligence. Um, and I don't want to put an image on this slide. Um, I mean, you all, you all know who I would put up there that has no intelligence and, ama and like, managed to accumulate amazing amounts of power in there. I mean, <laughs> But I'd rather not change the entire topic of the slide presentation. But, but I mean, seriously, look around at the smartest people you know. How powerful are they? Since when has somebody so massively curious and intelligent that has gone out and investigated every single type of ant been a person who got power? You need to fear power, not intelligence. And what's going on in this, um, the current, what I might call a cash grab, is the biggest example in human history of ask forgiveness instead of permission, in which all of the work that we have done collectively by generating text and images on the web is being scraped and benefited from to concentrate all the power that results from that into a small number of hands. Like, AI is fine if it doesn't do that. This is a political issue. It's a political issue more than a technological issue. So there's, if an AI is massively intelligent, who knows what it would do? Who knows? Okay, maybe terrible things, but you know what? Since when super in has intelligence of any rate actually translated directly to power, and pools of power are being concentrated, and that's actually a bigger uh, problem than we have in the moment. Another thing to talk about is these ideas of certain kind of woo-adjacent concepts like consciousness, awakening, sentience, agency, all these, well, you know, when is it artificial general intelligence? When is it not just a single person intelligence? Well, when is it person-like? Well, what the hell is person-like? It's very useful to get down to each trait that you thought you were talking about when you were like, well, is a machine person-like yet? Let's take, for instance, agency. So um, in the 2010 flash crash, there were cell bots on, on uh, Wall Street that were programmed to buy and sell. They didn't have agency. Well, kind of they did. Like, they had intentions to avoid losing money. They acted on those intentions by selling stocks that were falling. Each individual sell bot would have saved its owner billions of dollars out of the tr like trillions. Uh, but if it weren't for all the others. And all, just like an avalanche, like an avalanche doesn't have agency, but the avalanche that does not have agency will still kill you. 
So the idea of agency is, well, I mean, yes, that could be bad, but also you don't necessarily need it to have a problem. So there was collective agency that emerged from all those cell bots within five minutes, destroying a trillion dollars. That actually is what we need to not just think about, oh, well, you know what, I'm really concerned about it waking up into sentience. You know what, okay, maybe, I mean, I guess that could make things worse. Might make things better, might make things worse, but like, all of these woo-related con concepts about awakening concepts, uh, agency, sentience, are actually, whether they happen or not, it's still bad. And that's actually a more important thing to, to focus on. Okay, so there's a scenario. Um, large language models flood the entire internet with um, search engine optimization and spam. So pretty soon, next thing you know, all of the services we love and enjoy and use, like we've been having a sort of um, statistical process to figure out how to s detect spam in our email. It's worked pretty well. But now, large language models could optimize for each one of you to know how to avoid matching those patterns because it's a pattern matching statistical machine. It avoids matching those patterns and also tells you that it is your grandmother and imitates her perfectly. Um, and on social media, you know, like we all know uh, a guy who got his Facebook account hacked just the other day, but we can tell, and it wasn't subtle, and it's going to be way more subtle when there's four of them, and the person who comes on saying, hey, I finally got my account back, here's my, my data sector account. No, actually, that's another bot. Or is it? Well, yeah, it is. Or is it? Well, no, it's not. Or is it? No, it's not. Or is it? Yes, it is. Well, I mean, get used to that a million times over forever. Uh, and so, scams are going to run that will literally call somebody with a deep fake phone call and say that they are you and that they need money. Like, you'd like to be able to call someone in a crisis. And you can't call someone in a crisis anymore because everyone calling someone in a crisis that needs help is actually a scam that's imitating your voice over the phone and also knows everything about you from the data that's been harvested. So, what happens? The government then decides it needs to make everyone prove they are a human being. I can't, I don't know that this is gonna happen, but it could. That's pretty bad. You know why it's bad? Because they're almost certainly gonna be able to identify you individually. So now, they have the ability uh, at that same time, not only to say that everyone has to love, let's say, in this scenario, it's not hypothetical, I know I'm drawing on a lot of if this, then this, if, 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 if. Um, but they can identify you individually, and they can use large language models for sen sentiment analysis to find out whether you dislike the government, which is happening in China, or whether you dislike the company that runs the AI model, or what have you. You can be surveilled at scale, and they know it's you. So this is gonna be like, kind of, if that happens, it's gonna be really, really easy to suppress governmental dissent, but also just to suppress people not liking the product your company makes. And at, at scale, and here's the thing, like, remember what I said before in the thing about the, the Persian rugs, that it's actually wildly inaccurate? you're actually gonna go to the gulag in Russia or China or what have you for things you didn't even say because an AI was impersonating you and also the other AI that caught that AI doing it was so dumb that it just got it wrong and too bad you're going to jail. So it's gonna be really wrong about things constantly. But it's still gonna have a chilling effect in that you're gonna be like, holy crap, that keeps happening to people. I better keep my mouth shut. So this is one scenario of AI doom that actually is not about turning the entire world into nanobots. And doesn't even have to be. So, some scenarios from science. Uh, what if a computer, as you're probably reading any science fiction novel, seizes controls of large parts of the internet, spreads pieces of itself onto many or all computers globally, develops sophisticated models of human social dynamics, targets particular humans with specific manipulations, directing them to perform particular tasks based on knowledge of individual vulnerabilities, gains control over supply chains, cooperates or competes with other AIs for power and control of resources, money, compute, communications channels, human servants, and institutional influence. 
Use superhuman persuasive techniques to get humans to do what it wants. Get subservient humans to attack enemies. Use its social models to manipulate human discourse and politics. Co-opt, weaken, or destroy human institutions and response capacities, including governments. That is the past, like, seven-ish, eight-ish, most of the past decade that already happened depending on how you define the terms in it. It happened from social recommender systems. I mean, all I have to do is describe the words Cambridge Analytica and talk about what happened with that as a, like it doesn't have to be what we show in science fiction to be very serious. Like in some sense, even the supply chain, like you can't turn them off. There's not an army of robots guarding the server farms. The reason you can't turn it off is that the company's entire business model now depends on it, and even if you're the CEO, the board will fire you. Even if you're the board, the shareholders will fire you. The company is now a type of AI in a different sense, not error back propagation, but a type of AI that was invented centuries ago called the Limited Liability Corporation that has its own interests separate from human welfare and separate from all of the individuals within it. You can't turn them off. You already can't shut them off. We can, we can, but it's gonna be just as, as challenging as we see it with heroes doing it in the movies. We can do it as a society, but we're gonna to have to like shift the perspective on it in order for that to be able to happen. Uh, and it is gonna be done. It's gonna be, it's gonna be stupid, folks. <laughs> so I don't know if you know this, uh, this, this, this clip is from, uh, Brazil by Terry, the Terry Gilliam movie in which Robert De Niro was like a, a Robin Hood style criminal repairman that went around fixing people's air conditioners illegally and like escaping on the land before the cops could show up to arrest him for it. That's an example of a mundane dystopia that's just so dumb. Like it's just, it's not gonna be flashy, it's not gonna be sexy, it's not gonna be, oh my god, how can we truly have smart competition in their galaxy brain versus our galaxy brain. And it's just gonna be like, Ah, it's just gonna be so dumb. It's gonna be um, your slightly raised uncle at Thanksgiving multiplied by a trillion. Um, but the thing is that everybody's gonna say, here's a deep fake, the president's face fell off and showed he was an animatronic. No, that's a deep fake. No, it's not. Some reason, like, I was literally physically there, but like, you're a liar. And Everything's going to be called a deep fake, but the thing is, they might be right. Like, it might actually be a deep fake. Uh, every, every politician is going to say every single thing that would embarrass them the absolute most on video, even though half the time they did say it in person in order to rally their base in person. The other half of the time, they didn't say it at all and somebody deep faked it. And, like, no, obviously not everything is a deep fake, but you're going to have to, we're going to have to develop a new media literacy gonna have to develop, develop it in the next couple of years. So get ready for our next election cycle to be wild. <laughs> uh, but the stupid mundane dystopia is pervasive digital surveillance that I described in, in briefly in some of the previous slides. It's gonna be inadequate cybersecurity, which has always been wildly bad, and with large language models just telling you directly how to hack things, it's gonna be, <laughs> ridiculously easy. We have huge pools of data that's been collected on all of us that are just sitting in data centers for no reason. For no reason, just sitting there. Uh, it's gonna be used. Automated identification and censorship of dissidents, such as happening in China, and unreliable and misleading systems. I mean, it's gonna cause a lot of problems. If people can't even agree, like, if, pe if this had happened, if, you know, if this had been several years advanced, there would have been no way to tell whether, you know what, I don't want to mention any hot button issues. But like it would have been seriously way more confusing as to the base ground level of reality. But am I wrong in saying that it already was confusing as to what is the base shared reality that we share? Like what reality do we share in even the concept of facts? That's gonna get 10 times worse. So that's what is so stupid and mundane about this stuff. Some disputes. And it is totally avertible. I'm not doom and gloom here, but Let's get focused on the things we already know that literally already happened as an existence proof 
And you know what? Maybe we will get turned into nanobots, but you know what? I don't think I'm going to go against that definition. We should demand legislation against non-consensual collection and storage of our data. I mean, just as a start, just as a start, demand legislation. Uh, you got to install a blocker app. I mean, I know everybody in here has either already installed a bazillion blocker apps, or every relative they have who works in the tech industry has told them to install blocker apps. But um, it's really important. Consumer Reports Security Planner. Um, and I'll put out this. I'll put out the slide presentation on the internet afterward if anybody wants to look at it. I've got all the notes on all the slides instead of just images. But I don't want to read my slides. To you. Um, but so Consumer Reports Security Planner. Wire cutters, every step to simple online security. Uh, zebra crossing is another good resource. Privacy guys is another word, resource. You're going to need to pick out whatever is for your system, right? Android, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, you know, iPhone, whatever it is. There's, there's going to be different tools you'll use based on that. And um, it's time to start mistrusting anything that they put the word AI on. You know what? I want the rice cooker back that just had a timer and a thermometer. And a, like a timer and a thermometer. That's what I want in my rice cooker. Make machines, and they do the things that you want them to do. Um, and it's an untrustworthy marketing gimmick. Just always see it. Just always see it as an untrustworthy marketing gimmick. Uh, and media literacy gets ready to adapt to a world in which there's a video of someone doing something, and they call it a deep fake, and they deny that they did it, and sometimes they'll be lying, and sometimes they won't. Uh, so we're still going to use backprop. Uh, backprop. Uh, let's say you're a company that employs backprop uh, error backpropagation. That I remember, we're not going to call it neural nets. We're not going to call it machine learning. I certainly prefer not to. It's error backpropagation, a specific statistical style which is massively unreliable and risky, uh, and not to mention expensive. So as you're you're still going to try to use this, well, okay, just accept that anything it gives you, you have to have a human being check it. Kind of like, okay, I drive a self-driving car, my hands are on the steering wheel, and my foot is on the pedal, like I'm ready to take over from the self-driving car. This is an example. I use some mid-journey sometimes. I didn't use mid-journey for any of these slides as an image um, synthesis. And I'm not putting anything out there into my actual materials without having looked at it first. But I, as a human with judgment, then look at this pile of crap that's usually wrong, and then there's something that's pretty good. Oh, that was nice. See, so entertainment is actually a reasonably decent application of large language models. If you like, I wouldn't mind playing a massively multiplayer online game with some NPCs that occasionally started like talking about some completely out of their actual fantasy world thing for some like breaking character. I like that. It was it was fun. Like it's going to give me a lot more fun. It's also going to do something completely stupid and say something completely wrong for that fantasy world. Okay, well, what's the harm? What's the harm? Um, let's look at the image on the slide. They said, to a backprop network, we're going to ask you to train to put together a bunch of pieces we will give you in a physics simulation with joints, motors, and rods. Now, I want you to assemble it in a certain way and then have it walk to the finish line. Roll to the finish line, crawl to the finish line, make a snake-like motion to the finish line. We don't care, just ambulate. Um, and then it would do error back propagation, where every time it had a very slow finish or didn't make it to the finish line within a certain time, it would be like, well, that failed. Back propagate that error. And it gave them the winner. Here's the winner. I'm showing it on the screen here. Uh, I drew it because I heard about this verbally. It made a tower. It made a tower of all the pieces, and it tipped them. And the tip of the, the tip went over the finish line. <laughs> It doesn't do the thing you wanted it to do. It does the thing you told it to do. Because the thing you have to understand, if you are going to continue to use, use Backpop, is to understand the fact that it is fooling you. Now, it doesn't have agency and intent. I don't care whether it has agency and intent to fool you. Like, oh, I'm, I'm really having fun. But it's not like a genie that like, resents you. <laughs> Instead, there is no, there's nothing about that. It's just like trying to get to the actual thing fastest by taking shortcuts, and the shortcuts will get you. If you've ever heard of Goodhart's Law, in any organization, whatever you measure as a proxy for the thing you want, people are going to perform to the proxy. And pretty soon, they know you want the proxy. They're just giving you the proxy. Goodhart's Law, classic example, was that 
They wanted to capture a bunch of snakes in India. So they said, we will pay you. They said to the people who were living in these villages, we'll pay you for all the snakes you kill and bring into us. Problem was, they started farming snakes. <laughs> this problem is not new. But that's what, that's what the farm snakes kill them and turn them in and not hunt for any of them. That's what a neural network will consistently do because it is the most efficient shortcut to the actual thing you said. Um, only use back up when the results don't matter. And expect, so it's cheating by exploiting spurious correlations in the training data over and over. Uh, expect its accuracy to decrease as the conditions change in the real world. Like it was trained, it was trained, <laughs> it was trained on training data that was valid at the time when you had an inventory of rugs. But that's gonna remain its world. You had that many rugs and you shouldn't sell them. Or, you know, like, it's not real. It's territory is the map, the map is the territory. Yes? Matt, I think you've done a really good job explaining this. I just wanna ask you a question to make sure I'm understanding it fully. Um, when I think of interacting with human intelligence, for example, we're having a conversation, uh, or I'm having a conversation with someone, um, I'm, if they ask me to do something uh, and I'm giving them sort of feedback, uh, they can talk back to me and I'm learning from them at the same time. This communication, getting results, and learning and changing outlooks, it's all happening simultaneously. Um, but I believe you're clarifying is, and I think this is something that's very obscure, uh, as you've said, with, with these terms being used in kind of romanticizing and glossing over. Mm -hmm. If I interact with something like mid-journey, it's, it's not like that. It's trained, the learning has happened. What I'm now interacting with is the model. Right. And the input, like there is no mechanism for me giving it feedback. That's a separate process. Yes, I think I know what you're, you're getting at is the fact that right. you think you think intuitively, oh, well, I must be retrained. That's what we need to do, right? right. You no, know, oh, Matt, Matt, what we need to do in my company, we're actually just going to keep retraining it with the on. Noticed it certainly does. Like I've tried to engage with developing an entire software project with ChatGPT, and it keeps losing track of who it is, who I am, what it's doing. And it's... It's just like if I tell it something, it just instantly believes it. It's hallucinatorily like changing to some other thing. You think that it is now learning new material from, I'm like, no, the error message told me that method you gave me does not exist. In that moment, they'll be like, I'm sorry, let me try that again. It'll try that again almost as if it is learning. And it is not. Because like the memory of a gold, goldfish, Three prompts later, it doesn't remember that we had that conversation. All I'm saying is that it is an alien being. I like the image, and I wish I had included in, the, in these slides, of a shaka from H.P. Lovecraft, a tentacle monster, and it has a big eyeball mouth, and it's putting out these tentacles to form a little human face. And we're like, oh, we really don't like that. So we're gonna put a little yellow smiley face mask on that human face. But let's, we're fooling ourselves into believing that it thinks the way we are intuitively expecting it to think, you're gonna still get bad results until you actually figure out what on earth is it in point of fact actually doing, which we are about to get to. What you should do instead of assuming that it is person-like, which is again falling for the metaphor as if the metaphor is real. Thank, yeah, thank you for bringing up that fact. Did that, did that clarify your question? I think so. Uh, I think that there's a common I hope it's common misperception, not just me, that that, um, that learning from errors, you know, learning is a metaphor. Yeah. Um, you have to. It is happening when you're using yeah. that tool. It doesn't learn from the world. The training is a totally separate process on. Yeah, there's human reinforcement, uh, human training with, uh, human learning with, what's it called? Reinforcement learning with human feedback. RLHF. I keep getting the letters mixed around, but that's a bad. Uh, but RLHF is where you take the training and then you further train it to be like, I don't like that. You said a, you, you said something I don't like. Um, where that's putting the mask on the on the tentacles, fake human head. That's all that it's doing. It's putting a mask on there, but something is going on in the background that will still trip you up when you least expect it because now you're training it in how to fool you. That's the only thing 
reinforcement learning with human feedback does. Trains it in how to fool humans better when really it's doing this. It's not evil. It just doesn't care. It just has a mission. So let's talk about uh, some measures for uh, developers today. Um, let's say you're a, a, a machine learning or you know, fat cop developer. There's such a thing as capability-based computer architecture, which enforces security and correctness at the hardware level. It's going to be a pretty big deal to actually spread around hardware that actually exists like that. So that's a, that's a huge infrastructure problem. But it is possible to get better security by just um, enforcing specific capabilities that something has permission or does not have permission to do. It's kind of like better than or easier to implement than the current, um, you know, can you, in Linux, can you read this, can you write this, can you write to this, can a user, can another person, like, this is really, really, really fun where you, it's called capability-based computer. Capability-based operating systems enforce much more stringent and fine-grained permissions than conventional ones, because we need computer security. Um, language security, new computer languages that produce intrinsically secure or more secure network software. Formal program verification, which uses semi-automatic theorem provers to ensure correctness relative to a specification. And if you're making a backdrop system, you can, you can um, continue to invent, there are currently being invented watermarking systems that will watermark the output of that backprop system at the source. So that now it can be identified, oh, there's a watermark in there, you know, that actually came from this backprop system. Denialist stack overflow. <laughs> Denialist stack overflow in your training model. <laughs> Not allowed. <laughs> so far, the more safer, uh, safer and more understandable than courses. Yes? The watermark, is that in the training data or in the model? Um, it's, you actually can do it at both passes. So uh, what they're currently trying to invent, it's not finished those work very well yet, but to incorporate watermarks somehow into the training process and also separately, the inference process, which is really, really hard. And thirdly, they create an image or a prompt or like prompt response to text and then watermark it. Which, by the way, it would be awesome if... Uh, because the developers are so in love with their software, they've got, they've got ChatGPT that you can easily jailbreak by telling it to role play someone who needs you to tell you how to produce a bomb, or you know all the other things it's supposed to not be able to do. But the thing is, if they created the prompt, the AI has generated not the, the response, the AI has generated the response to your prompt now. You have a second system that looks for keywords in it, and it's just a dumb system, and it definitely blocks it because it says Napalm. You could try doing that too. They don't, because they're in love with the original system being so perfect and such an inscrutable oracle that it must work. Yes? How much is the, um, in terms of the progress of what's called, what's it, AI, which, what does intelligence really mean? Um, are we doing it by the our current um, way of being on architecture of computers? We're still using cloud different architecture. And it seems to me that that itself would be a fundamental limited liberty factor. The human brain is incredibly complex. We develop these complex models about how the universe works and that yeah. it's very dynamic and interactive and the neural networks in our brains are so much more sophisticated than it, the, it could be. And, and that's uh, and you know that's an interesting point that I'm, I'm very interested in discussion in discussing. But uh, that's actually one of the things I cut. So it's just out of scope for the talk. Yeah, you know, because it would go. Look, there's so much to say there. It would be out of scope. But that's an interesting point to bring up. Unless you're out of scope, go ahead. You're saying, would it be fair to try to explain AI as like a serial killer? Her because. Throughout your talk, I've been thinking of interviews with uh, the... Uh, well, it sounds like you're going to go to a long story, and I have 60 seconds left to complete the five slides. Uh, but I like, that, I like that point. Let's talk about it afterwards. Um, when you engineer something and you actually can understand it, it's easier and it's more understandable and safer than a biologically evolved system or a backpropagation trained evolved, quote unquote, system engineering. And that's mostly what gets done. Futzing around with hyperparameters that create different training results and then seeing what happens, trial and error, 
is what you're getting paid to do in AI these days. It's not engineering. We need science for the win, and we need engineering for the win. Science actually finds out what the world is like and what is, in fact, actually going on. Engineering uses that knowledge to make things stop doing the things we don't want them to do and do the things we do want them to do. And so we need to, first off, instrument the code. Add apparatus that lets you trace the network's computation during inference, not during training, uh, locating the pathway through a network that correspond to particular facts. This can be done and has already been done in a few limited cases, as is this improves. See how small you can make a model while maintaining performance, because smaller networks are likely to be easier to understand. Construct small artificial test cases. Uh, so there's Neil Nanda and Tom Le uh, Lieberum did a mechanistic interpretability analysis of grokking, uh, a cool uh, timeline word that they used in the title of their paper, grokking. Um, it was just a small network optimized for modular arithmetic. All right, let's try to reverse engineer this because it's small enough to do so. And then alter the system to make it easier to understand without significantly changing functionality. You can make a small theoretically motivated change to the quote unquote activation function. Uh, well, uh, let, let's, let's, let's put that in English. Uh, a model is divided into units, and they made a small change to a function that determined how much to weight each unit. And then they saw what would happen while maintaining performance. It's easier to understand what individual units are doing. And another paper showed that they could have the training process group its quote unquote units into logical categories of the types of stuff it wanted to do so you can trace it back. Like we've grouped the haystack so you have smaller haystacks in which the needle might be. Uh, in any given thing, we know it's having problems with this specific kind of thing, look in that group of units. <coughs> And let's talk about uh, a few more papers real quick. I'm actually just going to skim over these real fast. Um, I'm going to put up these slides. Holy crap, I can't believe I expected you to read that. Um, that proves that reverse engineering can be done and that we really desperately need to do it because then you can actually debug the thing that you're supposed to do as an engineer, which is your job. If you're going to design a bridge, the tradition is that you're the first person who drives a car over that bridge. It's been a tradition for decades. And this is what we need, that kind of security, safety, and responsibility. Um, not a paralyzing, hey, let's not have any technology forever, but just like, you know how to do science, you know how to do engineering. Stop doing PR stunts and reverse engineer and code something that we actually know that it works. Uh, I, Locating and editing factual associations in ChatGPT and so in GPT is another one. And uh, some conclusions. Uh, I, it is just about time, and I'm glad I actually made this in within the time limit for the talk. Uh, but error back propagation systems are one, deceptive, two, incomprehensible, three, error prone, four, enormously powerful just because of scale, even though they're massively stupid, and five, much worse behave when you let them interact with the messiness of the real world. The most likely dystopia is a stupid mundane dystopia, but it is entirely possible for us to not have dystopia, and it is 100% possible, achievable, and worth fighting for. And the existing automation and the problems that we've had in the past like decade with the automation of information, specifically recommender systems and information collection, uh, are an existence proof for the type of problems we already know can go wrong, whether it turns into a Terminator Skynet scenario or not. And those deserve our focus and our attention. I strongly recommend everybody read the full book by my friend and colleague, David Chapman. He quit the field of AI to become a Buddhist and examine the nature of actual personhood and intelligence we know exists, did that for 20 years, and then everybody was like, hey David, come back and write a book, and now everybody shut up. Um, having, now I'm going to take some more questions, but having done that, I want to thank everybody, because probably they're going to come in here and kick us out in a minute, I would imagine. Uh, so to prepare for that, I just really appreciate that everybody came out in this fantastic turnout, and you are incredibly fun to present to, and I think that if they do kick us out, I want to continue this discussion out in the lobby. So I will take some questions now. Oh, but after, before we get back to you, let's. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, any any of his books available at the bookstore here? No. You know, I keep I keep trying. He'll come on my podcast 
And I keep trying to get him to show up for things, um, but like he's so busy. He's just really, really busy. Okay, thanks. It's too bad, but he does have it for free, at least on the internet, and he's about to publish it as a paperback. Mm. Okay. Uh, and yes, 